Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Claire Schultz, the CEO of the Hearing Health Foundation. I want to thank you all for joining us for our second research briefing this year. Today we have a spe special research update by one of our Hearing Restoration Project Research Consortium members, Dr. Andy Groves. Joining us today for the live presentation are members of the Hearing Health Foundation Board of Directors, staff, and other Hearing Restoration Project Consortium scientists as well as longtime supporters of Hearing Health Foundation. Thank you all for your continued support and interest in HHF and our groundbreaking research. For some of you, this is an introduction. While others have heard a little about the HRP, whether it was at our research webinar earlier this year, through friends, colleagues, or loved ones, we're all here today because we have one thing in common, a personal connection to hearing loss. Our goal is that everyone who listens to the presentation will obtain some new information on hearing loss and our research toward a cure. It doesn't end today. If after listening to the briefing, time passes and you have questions or thoughts, we are your source for reliable, accurate, up-to-date information on hearing loss and other hearing-related conditions. We intend to have many more webinars with our researchers in the future, and there will be plenty of opportunity for learning as we go forward. Thank you again for your time and interest. For those of you who just dialed in, we ask that everyone mute their lines by pressing star six. Again, there will be an opportunity at the end for questions, but during the presentation, we ask that the lines be muted to minimize audio interference. Uh, just a couple of words on the Hearing Health Foundation for those of you who are new to our community. We were founded in 1958, almost 60 years ago and we have a reputation for pioneering breakthroughs in hearing and balance research. Some examples include, we were the early supporters of the revolutionary cochlear implant, and today over 220,000 children and now adults are benefiting. We advocated for the passage of the universal newborn hearing screening legislation in the 90s, and now about 97% of newborns are tested for hearing loss at birth. Throughout our history, our Emerging Research Grants Program has and continues to provide seed funding for early stage scientists in hearing and balance science, leading to discoveries in hair cell regeneration, tinnitus, to name a few. Many of our funded researchers actually have gone on to obtain federal funding for their work, and this is one of the measures of success. In 2015, we awarded grants in hyperacusis, tinnitus, Meniere's, and central auditory processing disorder, or CAPD. Our experience throughout the years leads us to the focus today, to find a biologic cure for hearing loss and tinnitus through hair cell regeneration uh, through our hearing restoration project. Since our last uh, webinar in May, Hearing Health Foundation has been very busy. Through our communication channels, the web, blog, Hearing Health Magazine, and social media, Hearing Health Foundation has included write-ups on some recently published research from both our HRP researchers and ERG researchers. This demonstrates your impact on the advancement of hearing and balance science and the path to a cure. For anyone who may not know, publishing research is a significant success metric for the scientific community. Through webinars and our Spotlight On series, HHF is bringing HRP to you. This provides an opportunity to get to know the life and work of the researchers working collaborative, collaboratively toward a cure. Please email us if you have any other questions after the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Andy Groves, HRP Consortium member. Dr. Groves has been an HRP Consortium member since its founding in 2011. Originally from London, he now resides in Texas where he works at Baylor College of Medicine. Before joining the HRP, Dr. Groves studied natural sciences at the University of Cambridge and completed his PhD training at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research at University College London where he studied the early development of the nervous system. He then moved to California for postdoctoral training at the California Institute of Technology, and it was there that he changed his research focus to study the development and regeneration of the inner ear. Dr. Groves then went on to become the section chief at the House Ear Institute in Los Angeles and an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Southern California from 1999 to 2008. In the summer of 2008, Dr. Groves was recruited by Baylor College of Medicine, where he is today a professor in the departments of neuroscience and molecular and human genetics and co-director of the graduate program in developmental biology. 
Over the course of his career, Dr. Groves' research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, March of Dimes, the Human Frontier Science Program, the Department of Defense, and of course, the Hearing Health Foundation. It is with great pleasure that I now hand it over to Dr. Groves, who will present his thoughts on how the Hearing Restoration Project is unlocking the potential for hair cell regeneration. Again, please mute your lines by pressing star six. There will be plenty of time at the end of the presentation for questions. Thank you and take it on, Andy. The conference is in lecture mode. Okay. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, what I am going to tell you about this afternoon is um, recent work done by members of the Hearing Restoration Project um, that are starting to look at the uh, ability of mammals and we hope one day the ability of humans to regenerate hair cells. Um, what I want to do first is to uh, give a recap and this work may be, uh, this subject matter may be very, very familiar to some of you, um, simply to get us all on the same page and to remind you that our uh, ear comes in three parts. We have an external ear whose job is to capture sound waves, uh, a middle ear, part of the auditory system, um, whose job is to take those sound waves and to amplify them, and then our inner ear, the hearing component of which is the cochlea, uh, and it's this uh, organ uh, whose job is to take sound waves and convert them into information that our brain uh, can use and perceive as sound. So just focusing on the cochlea a little bit more, uh, if you uh, magnify a cross-section of the cochlea duct by about 100 times, you see this structure uh, that you can see in yellow and red here. This is the organ of corti. This is really the, uh, the hearing component of the cochlear duct. And as sound waves travel through these two fluid-filled spaces above and below the organ of corti, they cause the organ of corti to vibrate up and down. And suspended in the organ of corti are tiny cells called hair cells, and it is the motion of the hairs on these hair cells, which you see magnified again by another hundred times, that are able to um, convert sound waves in the form of these vibrations and to make the hair cell become electrically active. The hair cell uh, makes connections to neurons, and these send uh, electrical signals initially to the brainstem and then up through the brain uh, into our auditory forebrain, if you like, where we perceive and interpret uh, those sounds uh, as speech or music and so on and so forth. Um, so this is uh, a picture that some of you may have seen before. Uh, this is looking down at the hair bundle of a hair cell. So uh, the, this is the, the hair bundle. You're looking here. This is the top surface of the hair cell, and the rest of the hair cell would be below the surface of this image. Um, and it is the movement, uh, as I just told you, of this hair bundle that causes the cell to become electrically active. And these cells are incredibly sensitive. You only have to take this bundle and deflect it by just a few atoms in order for the cell to become electrically active. And this allows us to hear uh, incredibly soft sounds, and hair cells can also respond to over a trillion-fold range uh, in sound pressures, sound powers, uh, which allows us to hear from a, a whisper to a, an orchestra going full bore at fortissimo. Um, so if we just look at a schematic view of the organ of corti, uh, hair cells that I've shown here in red are really the sound uh, transducers. They're the business end of hearing. But equally importantly, they are also surrounded uh, by supporting cells that I've shown here in yellow. And these supporting cells, as their name implies, uh, are there to firstly physically support the hair cells, uh, but they also perform a number of tasks 
uh, that are crucial for the hair cell to have its function, uh, to stay happy and healthy, and to continue throughout our life to transduce uh, sound waves. The disadvantage of having these incredibly sensitive little nanomachines in our organ of corti, these incredibly sensitive hair cells, is that while they are indeed impressively sensitive, this also means that uh, they are quite easy to kill or to damage. Um, and as I'm sure uh, many of you know, uh, intense exposure to intense noises or pressure changes uh, are very good at killing hair cells. Certain kinds of drugs such as aminoglycoside antibiotics or chemotherapy drugs that contain platinum uh, are also able to kill hair cells. Um, and as we are all aware, the gradual wear and tear of old age can take its toll on hair cells as well. So what I'm showing you on the left here is a uh, electron micrograph looking down on the surface of the organ of corti, where you can see these beautiful rows of hair bundles. And over on the right here, if you look at an animal that has been damaged by noise, I think it's pretty clear that as they say in Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other, um, and that many of the hair cells here have been destroyed, and the surrounding supporting cells have uh, filled in the gaps and created a sort of scar um, that in mammals uh, will generally not uh, recover. And as a result, uh, what you may have heard uh, is that hearing loss is both progressive in humans and permanent. And indeed, uh, what some people refer to as the sort of dogma of hair cell regeneration is that non-mammals, such as birds or frogs or fish over here, are capable of quite impressive hair cell regeneration. Um, but it is generally believed and accepted that mammals, uh, such as the mouse here, are unable to regenerate their hair cells. Um, the uh, discovery that uh, birds are able to regenerate their hair cells uh, was made in the 1980s by Dr. Ed Rubel, who's a member of the Hearing Restoration Project, and, he's, and his colleagues. Um, and I'm just going to show you a few pictures from some of the work of Dr. Rubel's lab. So this is looking down on the surface of the bird equivalent of the organ of corti, and you can see the hair bundles uh, very beautifully here. Uh, if you damage a bird with drugs or with uh, intense sound, you create a similar sort of scar uh, to the sort I showed you in a previous slide. However, if you let this bird recover for a number of weeks, you end up with uh, something like this. And I think you can see, indicated by the little arrows here, that the uh, bird hearing organ has been able to regenerate its hair cells. And over the, next, the coming weeks and months in this bird, these hair bundles will reorganize and go back to the original shape that they were in before damage. Um, and work by Dr. Rubel and his colleagues have shown that over a period of months, birds have a really impressive recovery of hearing function. Uh, and indeed, you can damage uh, birds again and again, kill their hair cells, allow them to recover, uh, and this process can be repeated several times. And work from Dr. Rubel and other scientists around the world over the last 20 or 25 years has really shown in birds what the formula, if you like, for hair cell regeneration is. And I've schematized it here in this cartoon. So what you're seeing on the left here is the situation before damage where you have these purple hair cells that are functioning. And at this point here in the cartoon, the hair cells are starting to become injured and are ultimately killed. And at this point, the supporting cells, which I've colored here in gray, um, begin to divide. So one supporting cell, shown here in yellow, will undergo division to make two cells. And then something quite remarkable happens. One of them will remain as a supporting cell, whereas the other uh, shown here in purple, will turn back into a hair cell again. So by the time we get over here to the final time point, you have restored the system back to normal. So one way of thinking 
about the formula for hair cell regeneration is that if you are to uh, evoke uh, correct regeneration and functional regeneration, you need to stimulate both the division of supporting cells to make more, and you need to tell some of them to turn back into hair cells again to re restore the system back to normal. Now, what uh, work over the last few decades has shown that while in uh, fish and in uh, birds, such as chick and in frogs, supporting cells are able to divide and give rise to new hair cells uh, through this process that I've just described. Uh, in mammals, for example, in mice, it seems that the supporting cells, although there are still supporting cells present in mammals, that after damage, these cells do not divide and they do not turn into hair cells after damage. And this really, to a first approximation, has been sort of the, the thinking uh, in the field uh, for the last 20 or 25 years. But what I want to do today is to tell you uh, that that situation may not be as straightforward as previously thought. And indeed, work over the last five years or so, both by scientists in the Hearing Restoration Project and other scientists by, around the world, have suggested that this dogma uh, that mammals are unable to regenerate their hair cells may not be quite as fixed as we may, may be previously thought. And just to jump to the bottom line, um, there is now evidence that at least the mouse, the mouse in it here does have a modest capacity for hair cell regeneration. Um, however, I would say at the outset that this capacity for regeneration is significantly lower than what birds and frogs and fish are able to do quite naturally after damage. Um, and moreover, as I will show you uh, in a few moments, the bad news is that this um, modest regenerative ability is unfortunately largely lost by the cochlear, at least, before the animal is able to hear. So there is this latent ability for regeneration, but it appears to go away. And in the next few slides, I want to highlight work uh, from scientists in the Hearing Restoration Project to give you at least a little flavor of the sorts of things that we have discovered. So um, some time ago, uh, my colleague, Dr. Neil Siegel, uh, an HRP member, and myself um, developed with our labs uh, a technique in which we were able to create a mouse in which the supporting cells in the mouse uh, expressed or made a green fluorescent protein of the sort that is normally made naturally in jellyfish. So we spliced its green fluorescent gene uh, into mice. And uh, in doing so, we were able to create a cochlea in which the supporting cells were now fluorescent green. And we could use what is known as cell sorting technology to purify these green fluorescent cells. And we could then place them in a dish and give them you know, nice medium and food, things to keep them happy and healthy, and ask, can these green supporting cells taken from a mouse divide and make hair cells uh, in the same way that one is able to see in birds and frogs and fish? And we were doing these in newborn mice. And I'm just showing you some data uh, from that we have published some time ago. And what I'm showing you here is a whole bunch of cells that uh, all, all started off as green, fluorescent green supporting cells. And what we did is to um, reveal the presence of dividing cells with a blue dye that you can see here. And we were able to reveal the presence of hair cells with a red dye that you can see over here. And so after we keep these cells uh, growing in a dish for some days, what you see is that lots and lots of the supporting cells are dividing, and some of them eventually turn into hair cells. So put simply, what we showed is that in newborn mice, the supporting cells, if one is able to purify them from the uh, cochlea of a mouse, are able to behave 
in a similar fashion to supporting cells that one sees in birds and frogs and fish. In other words, for a limited time, they are able to divide, and they are able, in some cases, to turn into hair cells. What uh, Dr. Siegel and I went on to do was uh, to use a second strain of mice that I'm showing you here, and here the hair cells are now labeled with a fluorescent green protein. And we were able to take this, the cochleas from these mice and again place them in a dish. And in this case, we are able to treat them with drugs that blocked a particular way that cells talk to each other in the intact animal called the notch signaling pathway. And what you can see here on the right is a uh, newborn mouse cochlea that we've simply grown in what we call control conditions. We haven't given them any drugs. If, however, we treat them with a drug called DAPT that blocks the notch signaling pathway, what we find is that many of the supporting cells, about 50 of them, turn into hair cells within about three days. And I hope that you can see that compared to the situation on the left, on the right here, we have many, many more hair cells. Um, and gratifyingly, this result has been reproduced not only by other members of the Hearing Restoration Project, but also by other labs around the world. And one of the great things in science is the more that people can reproduce your data, the more confidence that you have that it's actually real. Um, indeed, uh, the lab of Dr. Albert Edge, another HRP member, uh, has verified our results and has gone on to show that, in fact, some resident cells uh, in the mouse organ of corti are capable of regeneration after damage. So what Albert was able to do, and I'm taking a summary diagram from a paper that his lab recently published, he was able to identify a population of supporting cells in the ear that expressed a particular gene called LGR5. The details of it are not important. But what Albert was able to show is that if you placed this cochlea again in culture, and damaged it with antibiotic drugs, you killed some of the hair cells. And I'm showing these gaps here with my pointer. And what Albert showed is that without doing anything, you could actually observe the cochlea produce a small number of new hair cells after damage. And this is a figure taken from Albert's paper in which the resident hair cells are shown here in green. And uh, the white arrow uh, indicating a new hair cell is, in fact, evidence that this new hair cell appeared in the mouse cochlea, and it was generated from these uh, LGR5 expressing supporting cells, again showing that the neonatal mouse cochlea has a latent ability to produce new hair cells. And indeed, Albert's lab were then able to repeat uh, with variations some of the experiments I just showed you uh, to, to show that um, after damage, you kill many of the hair cells, so you see missing hair cells here, and then when you treat again with a drug that blocks the notch signaling pathway, you can see, indicated by the yellow arrows here, a number of new hair cells appearing. Okay? So this is all great. Um, this is suggesting that in early mice, uh, and I would stress again, before these mice are able to hear, that there are populations of supporting cells within the mouse organ of corti that are able to, uh, in some cases, divide, and in other cases, to make hair cells. So here's the bad news. Uh, I stressed to you that these experiments were carried out in young mice, in newborn mice. And what uh, my lab and now other labs have also found is that as you repeat these sorts of experiments in older and older mice, even just three days or six days older, what we find is that the, uh, the variety of interventions that I've described to you 
seem to stop working within the first week or two of uh, the mouse's life, again, prior to the onset of hearing. Now, something that I would stress is that what is going on here is that the supporting cells seem to lose the ability to respond to whatever manipulation it was we were doing to them. And these are the same supporting cells that were present at the time of birth. These are the same ones that now, just six days later, are refractory uh, to whatever manipulations we uh, try to uh, give to them. And so one of the questions that I will return to a little bit later is, why is this? Why have these cells, over just a period of, day, of days, appeared to lose the ability to respond to whatever signals allowed them to regenerate? This is the case in the cochlea. However, I want to hold out a little bit more hope now by telling you about some of the work of two other HRP consortium members, Dr. Jenny Stone and Dr. Ed Rubel in Seattle. Um, work from Dr. Rubel's lab recently has used genetically engineered mice in which it becomes quite easy to kill all the hair cells in the inner ear. For technical reasons, this was actually quite hard um, in the past uh, by uh, when people tried to kill hair cells with drugs. Um, however, Dr. Rubel and his colleagues were able now to engineer a mouse in which it was relatively easy to do this. And so Dr. Rubel and Dr. Stone and their colleagues examined in the adult mice uh, whether there was any evidence for regeneration. And in particular, they looked not only in the cochlea, but also in one of the balance organs of the ear, the utricle, that is, if you like, a gravity detector. It allows us to, uh, for us to detect the position of our head in space. And like the cochlea, the utricle also com contains hair cells and supporting cells. It's just that those hair cells appear to be dedicated to detecting gravity rather than detecting sound. What I want to show you here is a comparison that the uh, stone lab uh, made between the adult cochlea and the adult utricle. So this is looking down on the surface of the adult cochlea before damage. And similarly, if you look down on the adult utricle, in both cases, I am showing you the hair cells here in green. What you're seeing in the middle two panels is the situation in um, sibling mice two weeks after damage. And I hope you can appreciate that most of the hair cells have been killed here. If you now let the animals, uh, sub or let sibling animals survive for a further six weeks, what you can see is that in the adult cochlea, there are still no hair cells present. They were killed, and there are none left. However, um, work from Dr. Stone's lab that is really very exciting suggests that at least in some parts of the adult utricle, uh, within six to eight weeks after damage, I hope you can appreciate that there are now significant numbers of new hair cells that have reappeared. Um, and Dr. Stone and her colleagues are now investigating where these uh, cells are coming from, but her hunch is that they are indeed being generated by supporting cells in the adult utricle. So to recap, what this is suggesting is that in the adult ear, or at least one of the balance organs of the adult ear, um, there are supporting cells that have retained at least some capacity to make hair cells. And obviously, what we now want to understand is, well, what is different about these cells? How uh, are they different than the supporting cells in the cochlea that seem to be unable to produce new hair cells? And this is as good a time as any, then, to revisit the strategic plan of the Hearing Restoration Project. Um, what we have been doing over the last few years is to look at fish and birds and mice um, both in normal animals and also after damage, to try and understand the way in which these organs are changing, and in particular, the genes that are being switched on and off after damage. 
and of particular relevance to what I've been telling you about uh, in the last 10 minutes or so is that we have been trying to compare uh, young mouse supporting cells with supporting cells that are a little older, that appear to have lost the capacity to regenerate. And we're comparing the behavior of these supporting cells with those in the adult mouse balance organ, the utricle. And what we're asking again and again is, what is changing here? What are the differences that are happening with age? Um, uh, an analogy to sort of describe our strategy is if you imagine a city such as New York or Los Angeles um, undergoing its daily uh, routine, um, if you now imagine that city after a devastating insult, whether it's an earthquake in Los Angeles or a flood in New York, what you see is that whole, uh, a whole bunch of different systems are brought together to recover and respond to the damage and to bring the city back to normal functioning again. And in a similar fashion, we believe that after damage, um, there will be pathways activated or mobilized in supporting cells, uh, consisting of many different genes being switched on and off over uh, the course of hours and days and weeks that in birds and frogs and fish, will restore the system back to normal. And what we want to understand is whether similar pathways exist in mammals and to what extent those pathways can be activated. The second phase of this work is indeed to test those pathways using fish and birds and mice as model systems and to start to develop potential regeneration strategies with the idea that in our third phase of work, we would come up with drugs or other interventions that might trigger hair cell regeneration, initially in mice, but obviously ultimately in humans. So um, to give just a little more background to this and an example of this, so one of the things we're doing is taking tissue from birds and b fish and mice after damage and to look at the genes that are being switched on or off. And relevant to what I've just told you about is, in particular, what Dr. Siegel, Dr. Stone, and myself are doing is to compare young mouse supporting cells with older supporting cells in the cochlea, and then to compare these in the utricle. Again, to ask what is different about these three populations of cells. Clearly, something is different because we see regeneration in some of them, but not others. If we can understand the pathways, we may be able to manipulate them. Um, what this involves, obviously, if uh, a consideration of the large number of genes that are present in the mammalian genome, about 25,000, uh, it will become quickly apparent that we are generating large data sets when we perform these experiments. And a new discipline that has uh, come to the fore over the last 10 or 20 years is the field of bioinformatics, where um, bioinformaticians use uh, computational and statistical techniques to observe or to detect patterns in these huge numbers of data points that are changing over time, in this case, after an animal is damaged. In the second phase, we hope to take some of these pathways that we've discovered, if you like, some of these rescue and response pathways that we see happening in young mice or in birds and frogs and fish, and to uh, test and screen them uh, in the damaged cochlea with the goal of seeing if we can restore new hair cells. And there are currently new projects that are starting in this second phase of uh, the Hearing Restoration Project Consortium. Obviously, the final goal, which has not yet uh, begun, is to uh, then use drugs that can manipulate these pathways to uh, effect, hopefully, regeneration in damaged inner ear tissue. So, uh, as I alluded to just now, we have made some substantial progress in this first phase. Uh, we have uh, uh, bioinformatic data from fish and birds and from mice 
that are starting to suggest candidates that may be triggering hair cell regeneration in frogs and fish and young mice, and which may be um, blocked or at least attenuated in older animals. And we're now following the interesting work of Dr. St Stone. We're starting to do this in uh, the balance organ of adult mice as well. We're now also proceeding with phase two. Um, the goal here is to test some of the candidates that have been identified in phase one and attempt to either block them in birds or fish with inhibitors or to use activators of these pathways in mice to try and stimulate regeneration with the ultimate goal in phase three of using drugs in living mice that have been experimentally deafened. So this work is ongoing. Um, what we are already doing in phase two is to test some of these pathways. However, some of the approaches that we are doing so far are quite low throughput, so they're not very efficient. And so some members of the consortium, including my own lab, are now trying approaches to scale these approaches up so that in, instead of testing a handful of compounds, we can now test scores or hundreds, um, one after the other, um, or, or rather um, all at once, um, to see if any of these uh, candidates can now promote division and regeneration of supporting cells into hair cells. Um, and in fact, in the upcoming weeks, um, the consortium is going to convene in Seattle for its annual meeting. Um, and uh, at this meeting that takes place over a series of days, we will be uh, reviewing the progress from different lab, labs in the consortium on pursuing uh, these, uh, these different phases. Um, and this will also allow us to take a view, see the progress that we have made, and then to chart or modify our proposed experiments for the coming year. So that's uh, going to happen uh, in the next couple of weeks. So uh, I will uh, conclude there by saying that uh, we believe in the consortium that uh, the prospect of hair cell regeneration we feel is a plausible goal for eventually treating hearing imbalance disorders. And I think um, the, the kinds of experiments that I've described to you tr really trying to understand how cells work when they are damaged and when they uh, regenerate is starting to yield at least some insights into possible therapeutic targets. Um, and I hope uh, I'm firstly thankful uh, to those of you who have tuned in today to hear this presentation. Um, it's important to have your support, and we hope that uh, with your support and the support of others, we can continue to uh, move our research forward to really uh, find more clues and pathways towards cracking the problem of hearing loss and tinnitus. So with that, I will uh, now pass the forum back, in fact, to you guys. And if you have questions, I will be happy to try and answer them. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. To ask a question, you can hit star six and your microphone will be activated. For the uh, topic of tinnitus, um, how would you uh, expect that uh, if hair cell damage is what resulted in tinnitus in a person that the recovery would occur by regeneration given that many people in the tinnitus research community are focused more on upper auditory brain processing centers? Yeah, I'm, I would certainly not claim to be an expert on uh, either the research or the clinical treatment of tinnitus. Um, I think the consensus is that tinnitus starts with a peripheral insult, whether it's exposure to loud noise and so on and so forth. Um, and then the sort of entrainment of that ringing sound in the central auditory pathways, um, may, that may be the sort of end result when a patient shows up in a doctor's office. Um, I think there are at least some people who feel that 
if one was able to start providing input again, then possibly uh, one could sort of break that, if you like, pathological feedback, feedback loop. Now, that's just one idea. Um, I don't know of any evidence to suggest that that might be a profitable way forward. Um, but uh, that's certainly at least one hope. Um, part of the problem with doing uh, tinnitus research, at least in animals, is that has been a, a lack of good animal models. Um, I mean, simply put, it's, it's hard for a rat or a mouse to tell you whether they're experiencing ringing in their ears, although there are people who are trying to investigate this at the moment. Um, but, the, but at least one hope is that if one was able to um, affect some recovery in the uh, periphery, in the external, in the, in, the, in the inner ear, that might help sort of reset that uh, pathological feedback loop that's going on in the brain. Yeah, certainly uh, cochlear implants uh, seem to give that some weight since they do help some tinnitus patients. Yeah. And clearly, at least anecdotally, I think there are also some clinical trials on this. Um, other forms of brain input uh, have been uh, suggested to provide benefit to at least some tinnitus softeners, you know, things like, you know, meditation and, or relaxation, mindfulness. Again, suggesting that once you've set this sort of pathological feedback loop in place, it can be either broken or at least temporarily damped down. Thank you. Andy, we have another question through the chat box. Is there any evidence of regeneration in the human utricle? That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, we have pretty good evidence of, um, you, you can follow sort of the, the progress of hair cell loss by examining the ear bones of people once they've passed away. Uh, and donated their ears for, for research. And it's possible to characterize the pattern of hair cell loss in the cochlea. Off the top of my head, I don't know whether people have also done that in the utricle, the balance organ of the ear. Um, I also don't know whether there's any evidence of sort of hair, firstly, whether there's any evidence of hair cell regeneration in humans and whether that might lead to functional recovery. Um, one of the things that humans are really good at, at least with some balance disorders, are compensating for it by using visual cues and so on and so forth. Um, but I think before we even start thinking about humans, uh, we need to know more about what is going on in mice. Um, and I think the recent work of Dr. Jenny Stone in our consortium is a really good step in that direction. And so there's going to be a big push to continue that work from her lab. Hi, Dr. Gross. Um, one question for you. When, when we're seeing the recovery from whether we're looking at fish or mice or birds, are, we seeing, are you seeing at all a difference in the recovery, in the, the regeneration of those hair cells, depending on how the hearing loss was caused, whether it's a genetic loss, a sound-induced loss, or caused by one of the drugs that's administered? Does the cause of the hearing loss seem to affect the ability of the cells to regenerate? So... Um, my my uh, my uh, sort of knowledge of this is mainly from the work of um, Dr. Brenda Riles, who was a former colleague of Ed Rubel's, and she, I think, has been one of the people to really do different kinds of damage to birds and to follow the progress of the birds, not just in weeks but months. And my understanding, and I would, you know. Uh, I would say that I'm, I'm not, you know, an expert in her work, but my understanding is that if you uh, damage the birds with sound or with antibiotics, their recovery is pretty much the same. However, other people have suggested that if, that if you damage birds with chemotherapy drugs, um, such as cisplatin and carboplatin, that it's much harder for the birds to recover. Um, and I think there is indeed some evidence from Mark Warshall, who's a Hearing Restoration Project consortium member, that um, 
those chemotherapy drugs can, in certain circumstances, kill supporting cells as well. So I think there may be um, some, uh, some evidence that the, the drugs work uh, differently, although I don't know if that has been observed. There is evidence for, for that in humans from looking at human patients who have received antibiotics versus chemotherapy. We know they have a hearing loss. Um, quite what is happening, I think, is less clear, again, because humans aren't experimental animals. Interesting. Thank you. There's another question in the chat box. How has the HRP enhanced the effort compared to a standard model of funding one researcher at a time? Yep, thanks. So I see that's coming from Brian. Um, so I think the biomedical research in general is becoming more collaborative. This is something that the National Institutes of Health has recognized because they are supporting um, many, more, uh, many more research proposals that involve using, uh, bringing together people from different laboratories. Um, simply put, we can't all be experts at everything. Um, and as the, the sort of approaches to understanding scientific problems have become more complicated using more specialized equipment or uh, different kinds of animal models, it's become harder and harder for any one of us to be able to do it all. And I think the Hearing Restoration Project is a really good example of that. Um, I, would, I think it's fair to say that not one of us within the consortium is an expert in all the techniques and approaches uh, that we are using as a group to investigate this problem of hair cell regeneration. So we have uh, people who are experts in fish regeneration, bird regeneration, people who are good at making genetically engineered mouse models that can help us understand this problem, people who are um, pioneering surgical approaches to delivering either chemicals or genes to the inner ear. So all of us are bringing together different forms of expertise, but also different, uh, different backgrounds and perspectives. And I think that isn't just healthy for our consortium in particular. I think it's vital in science in general that we have to get out of this idea that each one of us can be a, an expert in everything. Um, and that we can achieve more by pooling our resources than we can by uh, individual uh, effort. And I think that's a pretty common sense way of thinking about it. Any other questions? Anything at all? Another question is coming in, so just give us one second. Will this papers from the Seattle conference be available to the public? Yeah, so um, maybe to give a little more background on our annual meeting, this is sort of a, uh, a data presentation and planning session where uh, we bring each other up to speed on what we've done. Uh, in person. I should say that during the year we have uh, conference calls similar to this one where we take it in turns to present data on uh, using this web-based format. Um, but at these annual meetings, it's more a, so a sort of planning session. Um, one thing that we have been doing already is publishing data that has been uh, published by, uh, funded by the consortium. So there have been a couple of papers that have come out already. Uh, for example, one from uh, uh, involving my lab and the lab of Dr. Stefan Heller uh, was published a few months ago in Frontiers in Cellular Neuroscience. Um, so the, uh, the work and the data that we're generating uh, is being published. 
uh, the group of Mike Lovett and Mark Warshall, who are both uh, HRP members, they have also published some of their work and made the um, bioinformatic data sets available to anyone for free. Uh, it can be downloaded from NIH-funded websites. So um, to address your specific question, no, we won't be publishing papers from our conference, but that, that's because this gathering uh, over a period of two days is more a planning session. However, we have started publishing some of the work already, and we will continue to publish the work uh, as uh, the discoveries are made, because it's important that other people are able to reproduce the things that we're finding. I'll just interject and also say that after the retreat, we will be um, Dr. Uh, Peter Bar Gillespie, who's the director of the Hearing Restoration Project, will be writing up a report and update on um, the retreat, so, and we will be sending that out to people, so you'll get an inside look at uh, what transpired at a high level from Dr. Gillespie's report, and that'll come out in early December. Other questions? We have a couple of more minutes. See, someone is typing. Will this recording be available for download? Yes. Um, after the meeting, we will be um, um, taking the transcription. We'll have it available in a link format. The full live presentation with the PowerPoint and the transcribed notes will be available through the link. And then later on next week, Early of the following week, we will have the printout available of the PowerPoint slides with notes in the notes pages. So both of those will be made available to you. It looks like Stu is. To, to Stu, I would say, gills or feathers. <laughs> Thank you, Stu, for your wonderful questions and comments. And, uh, you know, if there are no other questions, I will just end with a couple of remarks. Our goal today was to allow everyone to obtain some new information about hearing loss research our research toward a cure, progress to date, and what's next as we go forward. Um, as I said earlier, we are always interested in your questions, your input, your feedback. So please contact us. Reach out to us via email or by phone. Um, sometimes when the information, there was a lot of information presented today, when it settles in and you think about it, if things come up, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. That's what we're here for. Um, we will continue to be a reliable source of information for you all, um, particularly on hair cell regeneration, but also on other areas of hearing research. Um, and, and I would just close by saying that we really do rely solely on the support from individuals, foundations, and corporations to keep advancing the research. We receive no government funding at all. It all comes through the generous support of, of people like you. And we thank you so much for your commitment to the organization. We'll continue to provide you with research updates in writing, um, in email, and continue to do these research webinars throughout the course of 2016. And we've also started to do in-person, in-community in research events. So perhaps we'll have an event coming to your community in 2016. If you'd like to host one or visit in one, let us know. Thank you so much for your time, your interest, and your commitment to the Hearing Health Foundation. It truly means the world to us. Thank you, and we'll be back in touch with you very soon. Have a good afternoon.